All right, everybody. We're going to do a little uh, lesson today, Grenache and Syrah. We're going to do some lessons in terroir. We're going to compare and contrast different uh, growing sites and how that influences the taste and flavor and character of a wine. So got to always give our shout out to ETS Labs for being amazing and providing all the analysis for this. Uh, they're just such amazing supporters of Wawa Community College Enology and Viticulture Program. Uh, thank you guys for this. As usual, Gordon, Marjorie, Rich, and Steve, you have helped me more in this uh, wine journey than anybody I could ever imagine. So thank you so much. And our students also thank you so much. Okay, and so what we're going to do right here is we're going to have some goals that we're going to set out for today. We're going to taste four different wines. We're going to taste two Grenache that are a low tannin and two Syrah that are more in the moderate tannin uh, range. And we're going to talk about why they are the way they are. We're going to use some advanced chemistry to figure out how we influence wine style. And I also want to recognize the work of some of the students that did this. I've got some disclaimers to make. Um, these wines were not made in triplicate. These trials are showing today come from student-produced wines. Uh, these wines were made on a production level volumes that are representative of the value of internal, practical, and applicable research for wineries to help you solve problems and figure out how to do things. At the same time, these wines must be of extremely high quality and commercially viable, so they can't just be simple uh, experimental wines that are done in a lab. These have to be something that we can sell in order to support college sellers. And also, don't worry, no PhDs were harmed in this process, so this is not up for peer review. It is simply a fun study. And sorry, no refunds. So Walla Walla Valley Grenache. Let's uh, compare a couple of Grenaches and I'm uh, going to look at some different sites and how that plays out. So here we go. We've got two different uh, vineyards that we're going to look at. We're going to look at Cochran Ranch Vineyard. It's in Oregon. Both of these vineyards are in Oregon. And uh, the soil's a deep windblown lust over basalt. Um, the irrigation from 2016 was dry grown. There was no irrigation added. Um, it's at about 426 meters above sea level, about 1,400 uh, feet. Uh, viticulturist is Cecil Zerba, and the harvest date was October 12, 2016. On the other uh, end of the spectrum, we've got Riviere Galais Vineyard, uh, basalt cobbles on thin wind blow and lust. Um, it's irrigated. It's about 228 meters above sea level, so about 750 feet. And uh, Ryan Driver is the, the viticulturist out there, and Ryan is a graduate of our program. And it was also picked on the same day. So the idea here was to pick the variety of Grenache on the same day, same tonnage, and make it uh, identically. So we got to give a shout out to the groups that helped out with this. Uh, John Phillips, Sager Small, Lance Sappington, and Jack Perry were all super helpful, and they're all still involved in the wine industry. And then on the other side, we've got Will Thompson, Melanie Kinchin, uh, Tyler Morrison, and again, Lance, because he is a huge Roan fan. So he jumped in on both of these, and we were really fortunate to have him in on this. So it's really a, a fun project for everybody. So here's our harvest data, two totally different sites, picked on the same day, and they're the same. I mean, for all intents and purposes, uh, that's a harvest difference uh, of sampling difference. Um, the titratable acidity is slightly different, but we're looking at really similar bricks, really similar glucose fructose, and really similar pH. Just down the line, absolutely very, very similar. So the takeaway is basic chemistry of these grapes is really identical. It would not be uncommon to see this type of variable between the grape samples in the same block. Even like one acre would not be unusual to see the grapes be this different on one side or the other. So pretty much identical. So we went ahead and looked at the acids and said, well, okay, let's take a look at those. And so we did a full acid panel. We looked at tartaric and malic, citric acid and succinic acid. And notice the only thing that was really sort of fundamentally different is the Riviere Galais had a fair bit more uh, tartaric acid and a little bit less malic acid, but those kind of evened out everything. Uh, citric acid was pretty similar, and there was a touch of succinic acid in these. And 2016 was a, a bit of a wet vintage, and when you see a little succinic on the front end, that's inclination that there's probably some rot out and about. Uh, still fairly low levels, but uh, showing that we did have a wet vintage, and that's pretty pretty obvious from the 2016 vintage. That's just uh, definitely knocks onto what that year was like. So differences take away. There's a little difference in malic. There's a little different in tartaric. There's a little succinic acid, meaning the fruit may have been compromised a little bit. There's very little citric acid, which only occurs in trades, well, it's in grapes must anyway. But again, the differences are still quite small. So we went ahead and looked at metals, because there's going to be a huge difference, right? And there's not. Um, we have similar levels of potassium, magnesium, calcium, and sodium. Uh oh 
So the potassium was slightly different between samples. Um, average potassium across three years of data is about 1,762 milligrams a liter with a standard deviation of 291 milligrams a liter. Basically what we're saying is these both fit within, well within one standard deviation of the mean and basically the same. So then we looked at calcium, magnesium, and sodium numbers that uh, were pretty, pretty similar, um, very much within the, the standard deviation of what we see um, from some analysis done all the way back in 1982. So pretty similar uh, again. So um, site is not showing a whole lot of difference at this point in time looking at basic chemistry. Um, another thing we looked at was copper, and I don't know why it's not in here, but uh, copper was identical as well. So we start to look at phenolics. Let's look at phenolics, because there's going to be difference in the tannin. They're going to be totally different, right? And they're not. Similar uh, monomeric anthocyanins, pretty low number of anthocyanins in the grand scheme of things. Um, 2016 was not a, a huge, powerful color year. It was definitely a year of elegance, and uh, that's reflected here in the color. Um, then we look at polymeric anthocyanins, and that's the same in the fruits. By the way, this is all in the fruit. Uh, we look at the total tannin. You can't script this, guys. It's insane. Um, identical. However, we see a difference. Finally, there's a difference. And catechin is an indicator of seed tannin, and we see significantly more in the Cockburn Ranch than the Rubier Galais. And so this does speak to terroir. So one of the things that's really interesting is, is Luss heats up slowly. That means that bud breaks more slowly. Rubier Galais uh, is a little bit different. It's in rocky soil, and rocky soil has a lot less water in it. Those stones uh, heat up and cool down really, really, really fast. So there's no, no notion that the, 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 the stones take in heat and then radiate it back out at night is actually not true. Uh, water is the big driver. Water is the big driver of everything. So you think about climate, things that drive climate, Mediterranean climates. Um, you've got really, uh, water is your, your thing that gives and takes an energy. So uh, it takes a lot of energy to heat up wet soil. And less soil holds a lot more water. So it heats up a lot more slowly. So that means bud breaks a lot further behind in less soil. Not only is it higher, where you have a little bit cooler weather up there, but the soil is going to heat up a little bit cooler. But that does two things. Number one, that stony soil heats up faster, bud breaks faster. And then what we see on the other side is once we start to cool down in the fall, the grapevine shuts down. And since it shuts down in terms of sugar production, what does happen is the fruit can sort of hang out there for a fairly extended period of time and start to uh, lignify. And the lowered catechin numbers is really representative of that oxidation and seed coat formation that happens on a grape that's been able to hang out a little bit longer. So we do finally see a difference. Uh, and we finally go, oh my God, hallelujah, there's got to be something different because these wines are totally different. So the phenolics takeaway is there's really no difference in anthocyanin content. There is no difference in polymeric anthocyanin. There's no difference in total tannin, but catechin is different. Um, and that has to do with that extra two to three weeks that even though they were picked on the same day, the, the uh, rocks fruit came out on earlier. So it got to start earlier and then uh, it got a little longer hang time and we see that uh, ability for tannin to knit up a little bit more. So finally we see a difference. So let's talk about how we made it. Um, the reality is these are basically the same thing. Uh, the fermentation length is really academically different because one finished uh, technically one day earlier, but it was just a tiny bit of sugar. So one's technically six, another one's five, but they fermented almost identically. The maturation length was really identical. Cat management, identical. Oxygen, identical. Bladder pressed, identical. And then they were all aged in a brand new Hungarian oak punches. So uh, from the same cooper. So there's no difference there. And then malolactic was Enifirm Alpha in barrel. So let's take a look at the wine data. And just like the chemistry data on the front end, we have a dang near identical um, wine data. The only thing that's a little bit different is the uh, titratable acidity of 0.2 grams liter different, but the VAs are the same, the ethanols are the same. I mean, really, really, really identical. Pretty interesting. And then this is where things start to get different is when we start to look at phenolics. So the Rivier Glais, even though it had the same amount of anthocyanins on the front end, had less in the wine. And this is something we've seen through our stem trials and other things that it seems like catechin has an ability in many cases to help draw anthocyanins in solution, hold them in solution. So it's a really 
highly reactive functional uh, phenolic species or an indicator of uh, phenolic species. So uh, that's something we see. So a little bit less in the Rivier Glade in terms of total anthocyanin. Um, our polymeric anthocyanins, a little bit less. And again, we have less of that um, initial uh, highly reactive um, phenolic base in those C tannins to kind of hold those things in solution. And total tannins, quite a bit less uh, as well. And again, just tannins, a big mashup. We've talked about this before. It's a big mashup, messed up pile of phenolic material. And this is really low tannin. This is just sort of a step above rosé. Um, you know, we start talking about, you know, big Cabernets, and they come in that thousand milligram a liter range. Uh, Syrahs, you know, six, seven hundred. So this is pretty lightweight, uh, definitely a very soft, elegant wine. But again, having less of that catechin up front and less of those, those reactive tannins, there's less to hold that uh, and create that, that phenolic kind of mess of, of tannin being knitted together. And then, interestingly enough, when we get done, there's more in the Riviera Galais. But again, these are tiny numbers. When we're looking at parts per million, we start talking about concentrations in, um, uh, in, in things like Nebbiolo. Um, you know, it can be like three, 400 milligrams a liter of catechin. Um, and, and it's not unusual to see 50 or 60 milligrams a liter or maybe even more than that, like Pinot Noir. So this is a tiny, tiny, tiny amount. Um, probably just a, really a sampling error, but it just shows that uh, we had a little bit more in the beginning in the Cockburn and then it became a little bit more reactive and probably just polymerized and became part of the tannin matrix. So these wines are the same in looking at basic wine chemistry. Basic wine chemistry doesn't tell us a lot, but using phenolic measurements are really useful to understand wine style. Um, so uh, these things are really interesting to use in conjunction with sensory analysis to deepen our understanding of wine. Okay, so let's get into Syrah. Syrah is going to be a little bit different. So the Grenache, we were just trying to compare likes to likes. This, we're going to go a whole different way. So we're going to talk about chemistry, phenolics, and aromatic evolution. So again, we're going to go back to that Cockburn Ranch vineyard. We've got a totally different clones here. We've got everything's different. So in this particular scenario, not only do we have a different site, we have a totally different approach. We have different clones, different everything. So not all things are created equally. And notice how different the harvest dates are. So one of the things that's interesting about less soil is that once it gets hot and the roots get warm and 2016 started out pretty early, um, the, they continued to race on. Whereas in the rock soils, when it gets cold, um, since there's no water in it, the soil cools down really fast, which means the sugar ripening and that engine of the grapevine just shuts down, slows down. And because of that, you can leave the fruit to hang out there for a long time without continuing to get uh, sugar ripeness. But you will get big changes in phenolic ripeness. So this is a very different scenario. And we did play these wines very differently. So I wanted to do the Cockburn Ranch winemaking team, a group of amazing young ladies uh, that are all super dynamic. And they're all doing some really, really cool things in the wine industry. Uh, very, very proud of them. Uh, really hardworking people. It was really fantastic to get to know all of them. So, and um, I think Ari is going to graduate from, uh, transfer to uh, OSU and she's finished up her, I think, fermentation science degree. Ellie works down at Slide of Hand. Uh, Annie Martz is out there rocking and rolling. And um, we also have uh, Bailey who's finishing up her bachelor's in agricultural science. And Cheryl's moved down to St. Helena with her hubby, Eli, who met in the program, and I had the distinct pleasure of marrying uh, them and uh, acting as our minister, and uh, that's one of the greatest honors I've ever had in my life, and Eli is a lab manager for ETS Labs now, and uh, Deviani Gupta is the assistant winemaker at Valdemar Estates, so wow, super cool. All right, so let's look at the harvest data. Again, just like the Grenache, really similar numbers coming in, um, almost across the board, a little bit of difference in pH. Titratable City is pretty similar. So looking at basic numbers, pretty close. Uh, not a whole lot of difference. The pH is a little higher, which we typically see, and that coincides with a little uh, longer hang time. But still, you know, not hugely. So uh, but again, we've got these really similar harvest data results. We need to look a little deeper to help us figure out what we're going to do with these grapes. So let's take a look at our actual acid matrix and acid makeup. And notice that the Cockburn Ranch has a fair bit more malic and has a, a fair amount less... Uh, tartaric. But if we add those two actual acids up, it's around six grams a liter. The stony vine actually has quite a bit more acid. It's around, you know, seven grams a liter. So it's got more acid, but the pH is a little bit higher. So if we add up those acids, this is that acid pH disconnect that we always talk about. 
um, the, you can have different acids, but the pHs can be different. So even though the Cockburn Ranch has significantly less uh, acid, and, and by a lot, a gram a liter of acid is a ton, um, when we add up you know, actual amounts of total acid in the wine, very, very different creatures. Uh, not titratable acidity, actually total acid. And then we look at the, the stony vine, and it's got more acid and more uh, higher pH, which shouldn't happen. That should be the opposite. So you kind of do this, what the? So here we go. This is this idea of potassium and buffer capacity. So what happens is the Cockburn Ranch, although it was picked earlier, pretty normal amount of potassium. But what it causes is it causes the, the grapes to be more buffered. And buffering is the ability of a solution to resist a change in pH. So we have a whole lot more potassium, well outside of a standard deviation, almost two outside of standard deviation uh, for potassium numbers, massively more. So that means this wine is gonna be super buffered. This juice is already buffered, we've got more acid, but the pH is already higher. And so we finally go, why does this happen? And it's potassium is the big dog in the room. And this is a really great example of buffer capacity and why those wines out of that region are just so high in, uh, uh, their pHs are so high despite having good acids. So the takeaway is this, long hang times allowed by the soil and climate increase those potassium numbers because those, those grapes, as soon as those leaves start to yellow, they start to senesce, they start to release potassium, and they're going to drop that uh, acid in, drop it into the grapevine to make it more palatable, to help start neutralizing acid, to, to help make it that, that very more palatable to a bird. So the other thing is, is the stony vine is going to have a pretty high pH once it turns into wine. And the thing is, is that even if we were to add acid with that much potassium in the wine, you could shovel acid in for days and the pH won't move. All it'll do is make the wine more and more and more sour. So you just sort of have to live in this risk world where you're in a really high pH environment, which is really tricky. So let's take a look at the phenolics of the fruit coming in. And these are very different. Um, we see that the tannin numbers are pretty similar, not a whole lot different. Anthocyanin is about double what that Grenache was. Um, but the catechin numbers here are pretty low. And so the thing is, is we remember we talked about getting solubilized, uh, you know, uh, catechin to help solubilize anthocyanins, to help build tannin, to help build structure. Well, the thing is, is some grape varieties are really quite high, and then it'll give off some dustiness and seediness. But in, in grapes like Syrah that are fairly high color, moderate tannin, uh, we might want to get a little bit more of that reactive tannin in there. And the way we can do that is through uh, a little bit of stim inclusion. So let's talk about it. So stems contain large quantities of seed tannins, such as catechin and epicatechin. These are just indicators of probably the thousands of different little tiny tannins that are, and phenolics that are in, in seed tannin. But these seed tannins help pull anthocyanins in solution, stabilize color, and build tannin. Consider your varietal. Would not be something you'd want to do on Nebbiolo, but something that's a high color, moderate tannin variety where you're trying to build some more structure uh, certainly can help out. So let's compare the wine production. Remember how last time in the Grenache, we basically tried to do everything absolutely the same? Well, when you're doing a, a trial uh, that you're trying to really discern what one thing does, you only turn one knob. Well, in this particular case, we turned all the knobs. We turned every single knob you could possibly turn. So making any reasonable academic comparison between these two wines is pointless. This is all about learning problem solving and learning how you can drive style. That's the point. So um, we have, in this case, we have a little bit more foot stomping and some stipping, uh, stem inclusion. So we actually foot stomp the fruit. Whereas the stony vine, we did 50% foot stomp, but we also put a lot of whole cluster in there. These stems, because they hung out, had longer time to hang. Uh, they lignified and turned brown so we could include more stem. That was something we wanted to do. Um, our yeast from the Cockburn Ranch was Lalvin Rhone 4600, similar to the Grenache. And then uh, the stony vine, we did feral. So we built a pied de couve. And we'll talk about yeast population dynamics here in a minute. And then our cap management was totally different. Um, with the Cockburn Ranch, we were doing punch downs. With the Stony Vine, we were doing submerged cap. Uh, maceration length, similar. Uh, the Cockburn Ranch, we also added nutrients and we added oxygen. We did all sorts of things to it. We're going to talk about why we did that here in a minute. So here's some pictures. Um, here's what a punch down looks like in an alpha alpha bin. And then here we are in barrels uh, with the same... Uh, little uh, uh, 
picking bins to keep the caps down. So we take puncheons, pop the head out, throw the fruit in, and then we put the head back in and then just ratchet strap a uh, uh, picking bin on top because uh, we are fantastically classy. So here's the wine data, and we do see some differences here. Um, the Stony Vine Vineyard has a little bit more alcohol than the Cockburn Ranch. Still not terribly high alcohol in the grand scheme of things. But remember that pH number? We saw that was going to shift, and that Stony Vine Vineyard has really high pH. Uh, years ago, I would have uh, been mortified to have shown a wine that was close to pH 4.0. But in the new environment that we make wine in, in this boutique world that is Walla Walla Valley, pH 4.0 is not unusual. And I'm not saying that's a good idea. It's probably a terrible idea. Um, the, the risk to these wines is very high. So you have to be very, very careful at uh, keeping an eye on this, this type of wine. This is not something you'd want to do on uh, mass scale uh, fermentation without having proper, proper you know, controls in place. A titratable acidity is very different. That potassium precipitated a whole lot of acid out in the stony vine. But one of the things I find really interesting is the difference in volatile acidity. Cockburn Ranch, these are both pretty low in the grand scheme of things, moderate to low. But one thing we've seen pretty consistently with uh, feral fermentations is our volatile acidities almost always end up lower if they're really well monitored. So um, uh, I have a, a few swags about that, but that's about all there are swags, but uh, considerably lower volatile acidity in the stony vine vineyard. And part of that might also just be the fact that it was a little higher pH and it was just a little easier environment for the yeast to get through. But let's go ahead and look at the wine, and we see a big difference here. Um, we see that uh, we have a lot more, uh, you know, we have similar tannin to what we had coming in. We extracted pretty well. Um, but again, that uh, Stony Vine Syrah has a little bit more color, and I think having that extra stem inclusion helped that. And I think when we start looking at uh, the matrix of seed tannin, we see that seed tannin really show up and adding that uh, extra backbone. And tasting, going back and tasting those the Grenaches, one thing that we learned, kind of rewinding to that point, is that in these Grenaches that we made, we definitely, uh, every year after this, because of this study, we've added a little bit of stem inclusion to the Grenache, and it is really profound what it does to the structure of the wine. Helps us get a lot more color, tannin, and everything else. So Grenache from either of these two sites, as we've done them moving forward, we've done 30, 40, 50% uh, stem inclusion moving on. So it was something that we learned, and I thought that was pretty cool. So... Stems contribute greatly to the phenolic character of wine. Oxygen helps polymerize tannin. Submerged cap is highly extractive. Uh, good or bad? Yeah, it depends. Well, what about that aroma? Let's uh, dig a little deeper. How about So here's a letter I got from Rich Desenzo. Are you going native? Either that or we're having problems processing the samples in micro. It looked like one of the VNTR profiles from the SC16. There were three major yeast groups uh, with a lot of allelic variability within the groups. None of them match any commercial strains. What the... So fantastically, we were able to build a yeast culture back in 2016. Uh, again, this was our Carmenere group that actually started this. And they uh, made a yeast population that had a tremendous number of different uh, strains of yeast. We made it in our vineyard. We did it aseptically. They got a bucket out. They went out and picked, um, and put on nitrile gloves, sprayed everybody down with ethanol. They bought brand new buckets from a Home Depot. They could never have been anywhere near a winery. I couldn't help them because I'm inoculated with yeast because I've been in the industry for so long. And so they went out and were able to build, still to this day, the only one that we had absolutely zero commercial strains in at all. So um, pretty cool. And uh, this uh, email stream goes on. I said, we did a little native stuff this year, and perhaps we're getting samples from that. We're trying to replicate that blank thing. It's a, a, a winery that's known for doing this. And I said, perhaps it's working. Here's the article here. And you guys can look this up if you want and talk about, look at how uh, we put this together. Uh, Abra Bennett, a graduate from our program, she went out and wrote an article on this process. She was uh, the formative person to get this started. And she has a really great culinary background. And so it really helped out with that. So, um, and then I wrote, it's been really bizarre to watch the ferments. They're thunderous. They roll their own cap overs. They finish in four days flat with limited reduction in temperature spikes. No dap adds nothing. I have to admit it's shaking my soul a little. Must be the tinfoil hats and cheap vodka that we use to make the pied de coup. Tinfoil hats and vodka. Sounds like fun. Any howling at the moon or ritual sacrifice? Next thing you're going to tell me is you're bearing cow horns full of shit in the vineyard under the waning moon. Rich. And I wrote, only if I get to sky do it skyclad. Interesting term. I was always pretty sure I knew what it meant. Googled it. Interesting images. Gordon approves. Suggests you conduct the ritual with redacted, preferably redacted. So this is really cool. This is the population dynamics of our Carmenere. 
And so uh, what we did is we were able to isolate um, the, the main strains uh, in this. And every day the Carmenere fermented, we sent it in for another uh, VNTR profile to look at what yeast uh, cell concentration of different strains were. And so if you look at early on, this actually is really surprisingly similar to like humanity. Um, early on, we saw huge variability in different strains of yeast. And then as time went on, uh, as stressors came into the equation, mainly ethanol, some of those early yeast died off. They couldn't handle the ethanol strain. We can see them disappearing early on as fermentation gets really rolling. Whereas other strains seem to be more powerful, more dominant, and do really, really well in this particular environment. But then we see another shift. On about day five, um, we see other strains show up and they're totally different to anything that was in the beginning. These are ones that were adapting and evolving in an ethanolic environment. And essentially what you see there in that arrow where we're pointing right there is this diversity, A, that's showing up at the end. And this is essentially almost like the cockroaches coming out as the sugars are depleting. These are the most robust and built up yeast strains. And also that point where we pulled that arrow, that was when we pulled it, uh, some carbon air, and we pitched it into the uh, Stony Vine Syrah. So we used the Carmenere yeast strain from our vineyard uh, to inoculate the Stony Vine Syrah. And then what was even crazier is we went ahead and ran the Stony Vine towards the end of its ferment, and it had totally different strains, and none of which were commercial. Uh, completely baffling, super cool, but uh, really surprising to see that uh, there's quite a bit of literature out there saying that if you've ever fermented in your winery, uh, you can't ever have such thing as a native uh, fermentation profile. And I, I, I would beg to differ. It looks like it can happen. It's a, it's a fascinating uh, study and it's been really cool to look back on. That being said, we've never been able to replicate it. So maybe we just got lucky. It was a 2016 thing. So now the next question is defunct or not defunct? That is the question. Um, and so a lot of people talk about the funkiness that comes from uh, the, the, the Rocks District region. And so we're going to kind of pull that back and, and look at what maybe some of those drivers are. So we talk about nitrogen. And uh, nitrogen has a lot of things. It has a role in yeast growth and biomass. It has yeast and metabolic functions. It helps alcoholic fermentation and regulation. Uh, it also has aroma, flavor, compound formation, esters, alcohols, uh, carbonyls, other things. And then also... Uh, sulfur metabolism regulation, uh, sulfides, mercaptans, and thiols. So these things can be perceived as rotten egg. They can be perceived as garlic and onions. They can be perceived as tire fire. Hello, South African pinotage. And, uh, or I fought in your general direction. Because if you eat enough so things with sulfur-based amino acid, i.e. broccoli, cabbage, onions, uh, you too can make wonderful uh, aromatic expressions. So let's take a look at these two Syrahs, and these are very different. And one thing we do see from the Ross district is we have pretty high uh, yeast assimilable nitrogens that typically come out of that region, probably for, for a variety of reasons. Part of it is the longer growing season. Longer growing seasons are associated with higher yeast assimilable nitrogens. But the other thing that's also probably true is uh, that, that whole region was uh, apple orchards and for the longest time, and they, they used quite a bit of ammonium, uh, ammonium uh, sulfate to fertilize down there. So uh, pretty interesting dynamism in terms of uh, the type of amino acids that are coming off of not only the, not only the type of nitrogen, but the type of amino acids coming off that site, those sites down there. Whereas uh, Cockburn Ranch uh, had a lot less, and it's pretty typical of less, also that shorter growing season and just, uh, you know, less uh, farming intensity on that, that previous soil. But let's talk about how we changed it. Uh, we we went ahead and added, we added the legal limit to the um, uh, the Cockburn Ranch. So we added diammonium phosphate to it, whereas the Stony Vine, we didn't add anything. We just let naturally happen happen. So we're gonna talk about sulfates, sulfites, and sulfides. There's all these things in line, but sulfides are created through yeast uh, metabolism, especially through sulfur-containing amino acids. Uh, so when you have sulfate-based fertilizers, it appears that the levels, I mean, we don't have enough data to say this outright, that this is a fact, but one of the things that we see is that when you have high levels of methionine and cysteine in the grapes, which are created through sulfur-based amino acids being deposited in the, the grape berry, if you have methionine and cysteine, it's very well eludicated by the beer industry that 
yeast will consume those uh, methionine and cysteine and they create a compound called dimethyl sulfide. Um, and then there's also some other ways that, that, and we'll talk about dimethyl sulfide in a little bit. Then there's other things that can happen through nutrient restriction. If we just ha have enough nutrients, yeast are really creative. They'll make their own nu nutrients, but in the process, they'll make hydrogen sulfide, which smells like rotten eggs. And that'll eventually turn into garlic, onions, uh, and things like that. And also elementary sulfur from either organic sprays or um, burning sulfur wicks in barrels. Uh, that can also be metabolized by uh, yeast and they'll create either hydrogen sulfides or different sulfates. They'll create other things that are just not terribly, uh, they, they'll, they'll create some things that may even be perceived as, as minerality in a wine. Um, so stylistically, some wines are built off various sulfide, uh, you know, compounds. So um, by Pinot Noir, dimethyl sulfide, if it doesn't taste meaty, uh, bloody, it's, you know, it's not right. You've got to get some of that in there. Uh, South African Pinotage, you know, diethyl sulfide and mercaptans are very much part of that um, uh, stylistic approach towards uh, South African Pinotage. And it's not, that's not a bad thing. It just is. This is just where they come from. And then New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, that beautiful guava and passion fruit, um, there are some uh, cysteine-based volatile thiols that occur in Sauvignon Blanc that get consumed and cleaved off to make these uh, beautiful passion fruit and guava aromas. And that's where they come from. So here's some different ones that we know about, but the one we really want to focus on is dimethyl sulfide because dimethyl sulfide is a really funny one. If you get it at the right concentration, uh, it can actually go to more of a truffle, you know, quincy, molassesy, uh, aromatic profile. Uh, if you miss it, it'll go towards uh, cooked asparagus and cooked corn and canned vegetable. But this is the one that we're looking at, and I want to talk about this in a little bit. So if we want to avoid sulfides, we want to make sure we have a really pure fruit-driven wine, which is what we are looking at with the Cockburn Ranch. Um, we are going to use uh, limited amounts of elemental sulfur in the vineyard. We're going to limit sulfate-based fertilizers. We're going to use foliar sprays and urea nitrogen to increase nitrogen in the fruit, um, and that'll also help. And then supplement fermentations with nitrogen just during fermentation. We'll add diammonium phosphate. We'll add something that the yeast will be happy to consume. We'll use oxygen. Yeast will use oxygen. That'll help to minimize any reduction. And then, of course, we'll get it off the yeast leaves pretty quickly. And then you get this nice, beautiful, big fruit bomb of a wine. Now, if you want to enhance sulfides, use organic sulfur in the vineyard. More sulfur, more sulfur uh, type things for the yeast, for the plant to metabolize and deposit in the uh, grapes. Uh, burn sulfur wicks in barrels and leave a little bit behind. A little secret to... Uh, Chablis uh, in getting minerality in the wine. Uh, limit your yeast nutrition. Um, limited nutrition will force them into this sort of funky state where you'll get some more complexity. Whether that complexity is good or bad, well, that's up to you. Uh, extended lees contact. The longer the wine's on lees, uh, this is going to continue to release as time goes on. You're going to continue to get more and more of these compounds. If you want less, get them off the lees quicker, rack more, more rapidly. Um, and again, large format barrels, uh, large format tank aging uh, is a less oxidative environment. So you're going to increase that uh, reduction and then minimal, if any, even racking. Um, and then also limit oxygen. And to some people, uh, they don't like this. This is not an aroma that they find pleasing. And a lot of people, when first introduced to these wines, they're just not really, really big fans. Um, but uh, for some people that have never smelled anything like it, it's something so totally different. Um, it's amazing. And so some people were really, really into this aroma, but there's also some other things that, that are going on in this aromatic piece too, is that in really high pH wines, um, Pediococcus can come along and Pediococcus is a, is a ML bacteria, it's a lactic acid bacteria, but it's kind of the ultimate cockroach of the wine world, but it loves high pH and it makes a lot of compounds called biogenic amines. And some of these biogenic amines, uh, like, uh, putrazine or cadaverine, um, are familiar to us through their use in fermented meat products. So some of these higher pH wines can have aromatics that are similar to um, uh, beef jerky uh, and uh, cured meats. And so that can uh, give you this more you know, dark, tr truffly, quincy aroma. But then we also see increases in um, uh, uh, these, these biogenic amines. And uh, we'll do a nice little talk about those next week. So what I thought was kind of cool is to do uh, some sulfide evolution. We did this up till bottling and uh, we checked them and in both wines, they had increases.
but then we saw a pretty big increase kind of towards the end. And uh, so it's it's up there a little bit more. Still pretty low. Um, we see wines in the 300s sometimes. So this is still pretty low. Um, I we, we tried, but we didn't do as good as we'd hoped. So let's do our takeaway. Uh, use of stems can help increase anthocyanins, stabilize color, and build overall tannin in a wine with sorrel-like phenolics. Uh, earthy truffle and molasses and even, even aromatics can be driven by technique as well as vineyard practices. Native or feral fermentation can be a real thing. It just requires tinfoil hats and cheap vodka. And a huge thank you for uh, hanging in there and paying attention. But just realize that there's so many things that we can do to modify and create different wines all the way through in the vineyard, all the way through into the vinification process. So realize it's up to you to make those decisions as you move into your winemaking career. What do you want to do with the wine? Where do you want it to go? Do you want to make fruit-driven wines? Do you want to make wines with more complexity? What's your goal? And there's so many tools that are available to you naturally that are right there on the table. You don't have to go down and buy. You can just create them. So from an artistic palette standpoint, think about what tools you have. You have phenolics that you can use. You can create them in the vineyard. You can change your canopy management. You can change what you do when you bring in that fruit and you ferment it. You can utilize different techniques to make your yeast create different flavors and aromas. Um, use all these natural tools that are available to you and you have that ability to really create terroir because that is the essence of what terroir is. It is the essence of, of the soil. It's the essence of the sunshine and the climate and the water. And then it's up to you as your culture and what you choose you're going to do, the culture of your winery and your vineyard, how you're going to complete these wines to tell your story. So there's amazing tools out there. Keep up the good work. Cheers.